Good morning, New Hope. Let's all stand up together and worship our Lord this morning. Good morning, good morning. In this next song, we just want to focus on those periods in our lives where we just feel like maybe we're asleep. And we need to focus on God's love to wake up. God's love will do that in your life today. There were walls 
between us By the cross you came and broke them down You broke them down And there were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater don't you? It's an amazing day. We're going to sing this next song called The Blessing. And um, I know my, many of you know my wife, she sings, and I know when we try to sing the song at home, uh, she can't make it through the words. It's such a powerful song. And when I think of this song, I think of the love the Father has for me. Um, and, but also, I mean, as we prayed over our kids as they've grown up through their lives, it was so important for us to say the Lord's Prayer, to teach them that. And then that's why I think this song is so important important because as a father and my wife as the mother for our kids and but as we sing the song it's it's a um, it's a receive song but it's also um, a give it's a give back and it's a it's a message about the relationship of the love the father has for me and the love that the father has for those that I love and so as we sing the song let's just uh, let's lift up our voices and feel free to raise your hands this morning as we sing this song called the blessing Shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing that again. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious.
Give the Lord thanks. Just verbally, verbally say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for the blessing of God, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of the Father. Thank you, Lord. Wow, what a moving song. I think everybody should, should pray that prayer of blessing, amen, over their families. I want to remind you this morning that I can't let a momentous occasion pass in what has taken place on Friday with the Supreme Court. God, God has answered the prayers of millions, millions of people, not only in this time of our day, but through the 49 and a half years, almost 50 years that this law was put into place, Roe versus Wade, and legalizing abortion in our nation and cultivating a culture of death and not a culture of life. The Supreme Court Friday reversed that. And they are now saying, we want to be a culture of life. We want to be a culture of life. I've always believed that this was about the rights of the child in the womb. Today, our nation honors those rights the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for every child. Martin Luther King said in his speech that changed our country during the black civil rights battle in 1963, quoting from the prophet Amos, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. The prayers of millions of people were heard in this decision and righteousness and justice have prevailed in our nation. Not a, that we would pursue a culture of life, not a culture of death. This was a cultural moment for the church and for the unborn and for the United States of America. So how should we pray? How should we pray concerning our nation in this area that has been so momentous, so divisive, and so difficult through the decades? You see, we need to, first of all, say thank God for protecting, to protect for protecting our life and hearing our prayers. And the many people whose prayers have gone before us, we need to thank God for the courage of the Supreme Court in the face of threats and in the face of danger to make a objective decision based on the law. Then I wrote four things. We should pray for the protection of the Supreme Court. We should pr pray for the protection of churches and pro-life pregnancy centers that are under threats of attack and violence. Some have already been attacked in major cities of our country. They have been threatened with violence. Secondly, we should pray for the many who are grieved by this news, that God would open their eyes to the wickedness of abortion. Thirdly, we should pray for the states as they vote laws into effect regarding abortion rights. We need to pray for the states that they will make good decisions regarding this, that the people will rise up and help make those decisions, that our state, California, would choose a culture of life. Lastly, we as Christians should be involved in voting for biblical values. We should be a people, of, a people who vote for people of character to be in office. People who make decisions that can have a life and death consequence 
For truly the church is the conscience of the nation and we are called to be salt and we are called to be light in the process of living in the kingdom of man. See, we're citizens of the kingdom of God, but we live in the kingdom of man. And he calls us to be responsible people, Christians and citizens in the midst of that land. Let's pray for people to rise up, for the church to rise up and be responsible in the area of, of making a difference. This result on Friday is the result of decades of prayers and active people being involved in the process. We thank God for them. We thank God for them. So let's, let's pray this morning, and I will pray for these different areas, and I also want to pray for you and me. So just kind of flow with me and ask the Holy Spirit how we can, can pray in a way that will, will reach and touch people and touch people even in our state as they make laws and legislation takes place within our state of California. Lord, thank you for the, the, the change in what has taken place, that, Lord, we have, as a nation, now decided that the law of the land would be towards life not towards death, that we would build a culture of life and the pursuit of that life and the happiness of that life in our nation, God. We thank you for the Supreme Court justices, God, that they had the courage to make the right decision, God. We thank you, God, for all of those that, that have been praying through the years and, and the decades of praying people that have made a difference in this nation, and we see the fruit of that today. We pray for the protection of the court. We pray for the protection of churches. We pray for the protection of pro-life pregnancy centers that are trying to make a difference and, and up the adoption game and up the, 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 the game of helping mothers that are going through crisis pregnancies, Lord. We pray that you will watch over them and protect them. We pray for the many who are grieved by this news, that, Lord, you would open their eyes that, Lord, you would give them a heart for the unborn and that they would see the, the needs of that situation, God, more clearly, that, God, you would touch their hearts as well. We pray for the states as they vote laws into effect regarding abortion rights, that our state would choose a culture of life, that our state would make decisions based on the child, God. We as Christians should be involved, Lord, in voting, and we pray that you will help us and remind us to do our homework, to dig a little deeper, to be responsible, Lord, that, that Lord, we have to li live in this world until you come and take us home. We are here, Lord. Use us as salt. Use us as light. Use us to make a difference and be the conscience of the nation, Lord, as we seek to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done and your kingdom come while we are yet maintaining here in this earth. We trust you, God, for that. And just if you're here this morning and you have a need, just lift your hand up real quick. Say, I have a need, Pastor. God knows your need. God, I pray for financial needs. I pray for family needs. I pray for breakthroughs in families and restoration of families. I pray for children being restored to their fathers and fathers being restored to their children. I pray, God, that you would restore us spiritually. If there's any sin in our lives, that you would forgive us and cleanse us and wash us and prepare us to be in your presence, God. I pray, Lord God, that you'll meet every need in spiritually in the body of Christ today, Lord. I pray, God, that you'll open up jobs for those that need jobs. You will help in them areas of income and relationships, God, that you'll restore relationships that have been broken and that ultimately, God, your will would prevail in every one of our lives as we walk day in and day out, trusting wholly in you, trusting and walking with you, even when we don't know what to do, that you would give us wisdom, guidance, and direction all the days of our life, and every step that we take would be guided by your word, and that your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we agree together today, and everybody said a hearty amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord thanks one more time. All right. Love on one another this morning for just a few minutes. If you don't know somebody, introduce yourself to them. They're your brother and sister in Christ. Love on them a little bit.
Um, we just wanted to wish uh, a, a super big welcome to everybody here this morning and to those who are watching us online. Um, but we also want to give a special shout out to those people who are visiting us for the very first time. If that's you, I know that's a big step to get here. And uh, as you can tell, this is kind of a family and, and we're all here for each other. And I think that's what this Get Connected card is all about. Um, we have ushers here. If it's your first time here, please raise your hand. We'll get this filled, ha have this filled out for us and you can turn it in in the back to our information group. We can learn how to support you better, pray for you, and most importantly, get you connected into our family. Um, I also want to let you know that there's many different ways to give through our church. Uh, you can see those up front. But I think what's important about giving is important. It's really essential to understand that it's actually about receiving. And so many of us think that, man, I got a good job. I work hard. I got it going. I got, you know, making money and all this stuff. But we hesitate to take that step back and say, man, God is good, isn't he? And God's given all of us in our own different ways. And all God asks is that you remember the source of what you've been given. And that's him. And that's why we give. Um, Pastor, you wanted to come up real quick and say something. Buddy, um, I want you to know right next after this is announcements. But this is Brad, if you don't know Brad. And <laughs> hi, Brad. I like that. Good. Um, Brad is the director of Foster the City. It's our foster care program. And in light of the Supreme Court, you know, what they've done, there's this whole thing about children right now that's taking place in our nation. And there is an excess and an overabundance of eligible foster children. And we want to be a part of the answer to abortion, right? We want to be part of that answer. So if you're interested in fostering, you are going to be at the table under the screens in the foyer immediately after. And even more important is supporting families. Maybe you might say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to take on a foster child, but I can help a family that's taken on a foster child. We need just as much help in that area as we do for, for foster parents. So you're going to see a video clip in the, in the announcements today. And then go see Brad right afterwards if you're interested in getting some information. There's going to be a training session so you can learn how to do it all. Yeah. So thank you, Brad. Appreciate you. Thanks for serving. Thank all right. God bless. All right. Announcements. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. Whether you're online or here on site, we are so glad to be doing church all together. We have some cool things we want you to be a part of. So get ready to mark your calendars. My name is Brandon, and this is your Sunday New Hope News. Now that summer is here, we are so excited to announce our kids and youth camps coming up. The youth camp will be July 10th through 15th, and kids 3rd through 6th grade will be July 24th through 29th. And you know by now that we are going to Heartland Christian Camp. For information on how to register, please go to our website, go to the event section, and find the camp for you. There's a $100 deposit to hold your spot, so don't wait. And with these camps coming up, this opens up such a wonderful opportunity to donate and help some of our students go to camp this year. We don't want any financial difficulty to prevent our children from having an experience with God through summer camp. So, if you want to help, you can find out how by going over to the giving section of our website. Hey, Pastor Bill, let all the guys here know what's coming up for them in July. Hey, that'll work. Hey, Men of New Hope, how's it going? Hey, Andrew and I are out here today at the Gilroy Golf Course, and we're just getting it all ready for you. We're going to have a great tournament out here in beautiful Gilroy on this golf course. It's, uh, it's a, an incredible golf course, and it's going to be a, a great day of fun, uh, a four-man best ball, so anybody can play. And I want to encourage you to invite friends, neighbors, relatives, co-workers, sign them up. It's only $65, and that includes a barbecue by Danny Martin, the famous infamous Danny Martin. So we're going to have a great time. Uh, there's going to be tea, tea prizes and long ball and closest to the pin prizes as well. You're not going to want to miss this. July 16th, Saturday, July 16th, 
At 8.30, check-in is at 7.45. I want to see you there. Next, we want to let you all know about an amazing organization that we partner with called Foster the City. Church, our cities are in crisis. There are more kids entering foster care than there are families ready to care for them. Each of these kids has a name and a story, and every story matters to God. We are called to enter into their stories just as Jesus entered ours, welcoming us as his beloved children. Foster the City is a coalition of churches committed to providing a loving home for every child, and there is a role for everyone. Learn more at fosterthecity.org. And today, at 1 p.m., there will be a meeting at South Valley Community Church, and we want to invite everyone who wants to learn more information on fostering or even support for friends and family that may be fostering. For more information this morning, please see Brad and Piper at the Foster the City table in the lobby after service. And lastly, coming up July 17th will be our Newcomer's Lunch. This is an awesome time where we want to invite anyone new or that has been attending New Hope Community Church to come have a meal on us and learn about the vision and mission of our church. You'll meet the staff and fellowship with other new members. So, Sunday, July 17th, right after church in the Annex, will be our newcomer's lunch. We hope to see you there. And that's it for this morning. But for anything you guys might have missed, make sure to follow us on our social media where we post updates. Check out our YouTube channel where we post weekly services in case you miss one. And visit our website to find out information on all the classes, ministries, and events here at New Hope. Click on the events section or check out our quick links. Now, let's get ready for an awesome message from Pastor Malcolm. Enjoy the message and have a great week. All right. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, hey, uh, young people, youth, any youth that, that want to go to the youth group, it's right across the street. All the youth are dismissed from the service to go to the youth group. If you would like to go, you can slip out now. That won't bother me one bit. I also want to say welcome to one of our U.S. servicemen, Valentino Esposito. Just stand and wave. You're a celebrity right now. All right. Remind me where you're serving. You're at Fort Hood, Texas? All right. Well, we thank you for your service, and we look forward to hearing good things. Thank you. Valentino grew up in our church, so I think I dedicated him as a baby. So it's great to see one of them anyway. And uh, thank you um, for honoring him as well. Um, I want to say also to those of you on social media, thank you for joining in with us today. So glad you came. We're in a series on First and Second Peter and we're in the second to last message of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. We're going to get into it here in just a moment. Grab your Bibles, grab your devices, uh, grab your notes, grab a piece of paper, whatever you need to do. And um, also, if you're new to us, join a small group. That's a next step around here. And then join us next week. I'll finish up the series on 1 Peter. We're also going to do a tribute to our nation over the 4th of July weekend. So God bless you, and thank you so much for coming. All right, Peter is still. We're talking about Peter preaching to the church in Rome and the Roman Empire. Peter is still reminding them about the end times, about the day of the Lord, about the coming judgment and the coming new heaven and new earth. It's all encompassed in everything we're going to talk about today. But it really encompasses the end times. I remember when I first became a Christian, end times was big. I mean, the late great planet Earth. How many remember that one? Hal Lindsey. Anybody? Okay, I'm aging, I guess. I'm dating myself. The late great planet Earth, end times was like the big deal in the early 80s. I mean, if you put up a sign at the church and said, the end is near, teaching on end times, you're packed. It was packed out. Everybody wanted to know what the end times was going to be about. And, and in my church, where Kathy and I first became Christians, there was a donut shop across the street. What a great place for a donut shop next to a church. And there was a donut shop, so I always stopped at the donut shop. And I think I've told some of you this story before um, or recognized a part of it. But, but in the donut shop, there was a, this guy named Harold, and he went to the church. And I knew his daughter. 
And, and, and he was a pillar in the church, but he was like an end times guy. You couldn't talk with him about, and, and, and he would just start in. And so one day I grab my donuts, I'm eating my donut, and he starts in, and he says, hey, come on over here. And he's leaning in the corner there, and I'm, I just want to get my donut and go. And, um, oh, yeah, how you doing? I knew he was going to hit me up with something. And so he goes, hey, he goes, do you know you're going to fly away? I said, what? He said, I know I'm new to Christianity, but what's this all about? And he said, no, 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 the Bible says you're going to be caught up in the air with the Lord. When Jesus comes back, the church is going to rise up to him. The dead are going to go first, and then those who are alive are going to go. It's called the rapture of the church. I said, are you kidding me? And he goes, yeah, it's right here. And he opens his Bible. We're in the donut shop. He opens his Bible. He points out the scripture in Thessalonians. And I go, wow, that's interesting. I, didn't, I never knew that before. Then he goes, yeah, but then, then he would go the whole nine yards. He goes, yeah, but after that, the tribulation is going to happen. People are going to die. All of a sudden, my donut's not so fun anymore. He goes, people are going to die. They're going to be martyred if they're Christians. And, and, and all kinds of bad stuff's going to happen. But then Jesus is going to come back after seven years. And, 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 and then he's going to restore for a thousand years. He's going to restore the earth. He's going to get rid of the devil. And then he's going to set up a new heaven and a new earth after the thousand year reign and the millennial. And we're going to live forever and ever with him and rule and reign. With him. And all that was one donut. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm scared. End times. I think, doesn't it capture our imagination? We wonder, what is that going to be like? Suppose it, it happened today, and, and, and what's it going to be like? I mean, the, the books that were written about this are, are vast. And, 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 and all of us are curious about the future. We're curious about prophetic events and, and when it comes to nations and wars and rumors of wars and, and then there's earthquakes and all the things Jesus talked to about when he says then that time, it will be like those times and, and all of a sudden we hear there's an earthquake and we're going, oh no, it's coming. And, and, and we are just fascinated and our imaginations run wild when we think about the afterlife, when we think about eternity and eternal heaven, what's heaven going to be like? And, and, and we think about eternal hell and, and what the Bible describes what hell will be like and separation from God. All of us are fascinated with what lies with life behind the curtain, so to speak. Wow. You see, Peter's going to address all these things. He's addressing these issues once again because he wants to bring hope to the body of Christ. He wanted to bring hope to that first century church. They were hated people. Nero hated them. The, the emperor of Rome, he was killing and ki Christians. He was blaming, blaming them on the fires of Rome, which he started. He was, he, the, 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 the Roman people hated Jews, and then they hated the Jews that became Christians, and they hated Christians that became Jews, and then the Jews that were not Christians hated the Christians that were Jews. Just saying. Wow. They were, they were a hated people in a culture of Rome and the empire then that was completely out of control, much like some of us feel like our culture is out of control at times. I mean, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the, the killing of babies was rampant in Rome in the first century and the second century. They didn't abort babies, and, and they often used sometimes uh, herbs and things to cause abortions. But most of the time, they just put the baby out to die after it was born and, and put them on the street corner for the garbage trucks to pick up. And, and, and so uh, pedophilia was acceptable. Homosexuality was rampant. Um, sin was rampant. Greed and narcissistic behavior and was, was rampant in that culture. And, and so they, they were, the, the Christians were in the midst of that culture trying to live like Jesus. And Peter's writing them now because Jesus had promised that he was coming back. And Satan was now raising up false teachers that were circuit, circuit teachers that were going to the different churches. And some of those teachers weren't even Christians. They were there for the, their own personal greed. They were wanting money. They were money-hungry teachers and they they were sharing 
parts of the gospel, but not the whole gospel. And they were sharing intellectualism to them that sounded really spiritual and intellectual, but had nothing to do with the pure, simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were altering the word of God, and they were going around to churches, and they were preying on young women or new believers that were women, and they were doing that out of their own personal sexual lust issues. And the enemy was trying to destroy a young church, a baby church. And just as the enemy was trying to destroy that church, Peter was warning them. He said, now I want you to pay attention. I'm about to die. I think Peter was looking out the window as he was writing this, and the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he began to put pen to paper, and he began to write these words because so many had been martyred. His wife had been martyred. So many had been martyred in the temple of Caligula in the Roman city of Rome, and I think he was looking out the window, and he could actually see the temple where Christians were being martyred, and he's thinking, man, I'm, I'm soon. I'm soon, I'm next, I know I am. All the other apostles have been martyred. I'm soon, I'm next. The enemy was trying to destroy the church and Peter thought, you know what? As I wrap up this letter that hopefully all the churches will read so that they will understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to them in the first century and God allowed the original authors of the canon of scripture to keep it in our Bible, which has lasted over 2,000 years, so we could learn about it today in a culture that is very similar to what the Roman culture was all about. And Peter wants to encourage those Christians to keep their hope alive that Jesus will return. He will come again, because if you remember in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, He said what? He said, scoffers are coming. Or in the early parts of chapter 3, scoffers are coming. They're mocking you Christians saying, Jesus isn't coming back again. He's not coming back. God's not going to come back and restore all things. Things have been the same all throughout history. It's called uniformitarianism. And I didn't know that that was like a big word deal until I read like five commentators that, that, that are known commentators in the, in the world, and each one of them used that word uniformitarianism. I'm using it now because I just like saying it. <laughs> uniformitarianism. And, and what did that mean? That everything's always been the same, nothing changes, the, wor- the earth ebbs and flows, there are seasons of, of, of the earth and the world, but nothing ever changes. God is not supernaturally placed himself in the affairs of mankind, which is the teaching of agnosticism or in moving right into materialism and atheism. And he said, everything's, the, the, the false teachers are saying, he's never coming back. And they, they even mocked him in verse four of chapter three saying, hey, where is he? Where is he? Come on, he said he was coming back. Where is he? 60 years have gone by, 70 years have gone by. Where is Jesus? And they were mocking him. And so Peter gets right into it, and, 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 and he wants to keep hope alive as the church is waiting for Christ to return. The day of the Lord's going to happen. And the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord happened in the past, and you can be sure it's going to happen in the future. That's what Peter's saying today. It's going to happen. All right, you ready? God's ways are not our ways. Number one, if you're right taking notes. God's ways are not our ways. Verse 8 says this. But do not let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, that's his pastoral heart, talking to his beloved. That's how I feel about you when I'm preaching the word and talking to you about spiritual things. That, 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 that the love of God comes out to me for you. It's a, it's a supernatural thing because I want you to walk in truth. I want you to walk with God's purpose in your life. And so he says, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. I want to remind you today that God is not bound by time. Remember, God's people were being pushed to give up believing that Jesus was going to return for them. They were being told that. They were being lied to. They were saying he's never going to come back. But he's reminding them today that the day is coming, and he reminds them that when Jesus does come back, 
I put a quote on there. I guess I should finish the verse. Uh, when, put the quote up. When he does come back, wrong will be righted. God's delay of judgment makes room for his mercy. No, that's not it. I, I don't have that quote. I don't have this quote on there. So go backwards. Um, God's reminding them today that when wrong will be righted and the right will be right, it's going to happen. Peter's alluding to Psalm 84 that said, I'd rather one day be in your house than a thousand years anywhere else. Peter remembered that statement that the psalmist wrote in Psalm 84. And he's saying that God is timeless. God, let me tell you something, it's a mystery, it's difficult to understand. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is past, God is present, and God is future. Do you know that God's already in your future? He knows exactly the days of your life, the number of your days. He knows your future. He knows what's going to happen in your future. He's already planned out your future, and he's waiting for you in the future as you walk into the future during your present. Now, that's hard to understand, but it's also wonderful to understand. I'm glad, I'm glad God has not, has not told me my future. I heard, I heard some stories of people that were taking that, the life scans, you know, where you can find out if there's anything wrong with you and how you're going to die. I don't want that. I don't want to know. God's got my life in his hands. Amen? God's got the future in his hands. That's not my call. That's not a doctor's call. And so D David had said, said that, that, that basically we have a finite perception, but God is timeless. He's above time. He's apart from time as we perceive it. Isaiah says, listen, the ways of God are not the ways of man. And so in Isaiah 55, he points out, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. God does things differently than us. We, if he said he's coming back, we're waiting for him to come back. Why is he delaying? We'll get into that next verse. Why is he delaying? Why, what, what do we, what do, how do we get God in this past, present, future, in this timelessness and, 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 and how God works? Because this is so important that we recognize that our ways are not God ways because false teachers were saying God doesn't keep his promises. That's a lie. God always keeps his promises. And, 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 and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He kept promises from the Old Testament. He's keeping promises in the New Testament that have been given to us to hold on to as believers. And here's what happens when you believe this lie from the enemy, that, that Satan plants this seed in you to discourage you. God's never going to answer that prayer. God's never going to heal you. God's never going to, to, to set you free from that addiction, whether it be alcohol or drugs or pornography or, or food or whatever that addiction is and, 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 and codependency and all this stuff that our Celebrate Recovery do such an awesome job working with people. If you're not in Celebrate Recovery, every one of us should go through Celebrate Recovery. I am kid you not. I go on Friday nights. Every once in a while, I pop in. It's so good. And you'll be so blessed. And, 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 and that the enemy comes along and says, God's not going to answer that prayer. God's not going to deliver you from that disease. God's not going to deliver you from that addiction or that life-controlling issue. And so what do we do? We give in to the, the false thoughts that come into our mind and tell us that God's promises simply aren't true. But God works according to his timetable. Okay, maybe he didn't heal you today, but what's tomorrow? We don't know. It's in the hands of God. Perhaps, perhaps God's gonna, got your miracle in store for you tomorrow. Perhaps God's your, got your deliverance for you tomorrow. Perhaps God's going to meet your need tomorrow. We don't know. We are simply called to trust and obey today, right? And to walk with God and according to his promises today. And so that's what was happening God works on his own timetable. Verse number nine, he says this. This is so beautiful. This is one of my all-time favorite verses. Verse number nine, it's coming up any second now. The Lord is not slow. That word is slack. That word is, is the Lord is not late. Peter's saying, hey, the scoffers say he's not coming. I hear, I'm here to tell you. Your pastor is here to tell you. Pastor Peter 
is here to tell you that God is not tardy. God is not late. He's not out loitering, waiting to just get into the game. God is long-suffering. He is not slack. He is not slow about what? The promises that he's given us in his word. He's not slow. As some count slowness, our time is finite. We think it's taking forever for God to answer our prayer. We think it's taking forever for God to, to return. Why hasn't he come back? But God is what? Patient towards you, not willing that any people should perish eternal separation from God, but for all to come to what? To change their lives. He's waiting. He's patient. He's long-suffering. He wants to give everybody an opportunity. He's deliberately holding back from the day of the Lord and starting the end times clock. He's deliberately waiting so that you'll get right with God. He's deliberately giving you mercy while you get your life right. He's deliberately waiting for people he knows it might come to him to get their lives right. God has this incredible capacity for patience. We humans have no patience. Hello? I, I, I think of this every time I go to heat my coffee up and I push 20 seconds and I stand there. Oh, this is taking forever. Right? Or you go wait in line at In-N-Out. How many of you struggle with that? Forever. You know, there, there's times now, you know, God's reduced me to be learning to be a patient man. Because I used to get in my car when I could drive. And I would wait till like the last minute. Okay, I got to go to the next meeting across town. And I would get my car and I'd go 120 miles an hour across town. As fast as I could to get to the meeting on time. And then I'd go 120 miles an hour back to the church because I had an appointment with somebody. And, and I think God sa is sa spared me because I can't drive anymore. I think God has spared me from getting into a terrible accident and hitting you, of all people. One of you. It would be just typical, wouldn't it? I could tell you a great story right now, but it would be embarrassing to my wife. I won't do that. <laughs> Stay in your lane, she said. <laughs> and so, so now I'm patient. There's actually times now I can build into my schedule the opportunity to walk to an appointment or to walk somewhere. And you know what's happening on those walks? Ev my whole, everything slows down for me. I'm praying. I'm thinking about my family, thinking about you, thinking about the church. It's amazing how much you can think while you're not going 120 miles an hour across town. It's unbelievable. Walking is powerful. And so God's not slow. He has this incredible capacity. And, there, and, and now it's time for the quote. He has this incredible capacity before he breaks into his judgment. His delay of judgment makes room for his mercy. Aren't you glad that God didn't come two weeks before you gave your life to Christ? Can you imagine? You'd be in the tribulation right now. And you'd have to suffer a martyr's death for the faith of your salvation. Because that's what's going to happen in tribulation. They will be martyred, the ones that believe in Jesus. And they'll, go to, they'll have an early death. That's the tribulation, and that's a whole other 10-week Bible study right there. And, and, and aren't you glad he waited for you? In fact, I think we all, I think we all should learn how to pray this First Peter, 2 Peter 3, 9, this way. Verse 9, the Lord is not de slow about his promise to Malcolm. The Lord is not slow as some count slowness towards Malcolm, but he is patient towards Malcolm. He is not willing for Malcolm to perish, but for Malcolm to come to repentance. I think every one of you ought to start praying that way. Put your name there. Circle it in your Bible. Underline it. Put your name in big letters next to it and pray every sentence and be thankful for the patience and the mercy of God in your lives. Peter's reminding God has it all in control. Aren't you glad God is patient? Throughout the entire Old Testament, God is constantly reminded us of in, in the Old Testament that he is long-suffering. He is 
full of compassion. He is slow to anger over and over and over. As you read through the history of thousands of years of God and the people of God, he talks about this, this, this kind of God that is slow to anger. And so aren't you glad God is patient that he's, you know what else you should put in that verse? You should put the name of somebody you're believing God to get saved for. Maybe you know somebody, they need Jesus bad. Put their name in there and start praying that name into the scripture and into eternal life. He wants to, he's waiting. He's patience towards your loved ones that you want to come to Christ. He's patience toward your co-workers that you want to come to Christ. He's patient towards you as you get your life together and deal with sin areas of your lives. He's patient with us. And then he moves into number two. He moves into the day of the Lord. Verse number 10, the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come like a what? You see, whenever you read the day of the Lord, I want you to get this. It is a reference to God's intervention and a reference to God's intervening judgment into human history. If you remember the scoffers, Peter said in the last days, scoffers will come, chapter 2, verse 1. In the last days, scoffers will come. He said, if you'll remember, those scoffers, they were telling you that not only was Jesus not coming, but God has never intervened in the affairs of man. That was a lie. That was a lie. Peter said, don't listen to the lies of those false teachers because God has intervened. God intervened when he came during the times of Noah. And he flooded the whole earth and he started over the whole earth with eight people, Noah, his wife, and three children and their wives. Yes, God has intervened. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? God has intervened. You see, there's three orders of the world that God has worked through in the times of God, in the time of history, in the times of mankind. The first order was the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, it was a perfect society. There was no sin. God had designed it that way for them to recreate and populate the earth and establish culture in the earth that they were living in that he'd given all of them in this perfect paradise society. And of course, that was disturbed. To, so the, 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 the first order of God was disturbed by sin. Adam and Eve sinned when they listened to the lies of the enemy and they took the bait. And so they sinned. And that began an order of sin in the world that began to perpetuate. In fact, it got so bad that God had to reestablish order with the flood. He wiped out all of mankind. He intervened in human history. He wiped out all of mankind and he reestablished a new order as we know it today. Before the flood, people lived 900 years. After the flood, they lived 70 to 80 years as the average. That's the average today. Man, men live an average of 76.7 years. Women ha live an average of 78.9 years. That's the average since the times of Noah. A new order of living. A new order of dealing with sin. God's going to come back and set up another order. He's done it before. He's going to do it again. And so that's why he's saying that something, the day of the Lord is going to come. It came in the past. He already told us that. The scoffers say God never intervened. That never happened. They were lying. So we need to listen to the teachers that God tells us to listen to. And so the Lord will come back like a, like a thief in the night. How many of you know that a thief, let me see what I got in here in my notes to make sure I get this right. Um, a thief a thief does not announce when he's coming. He doesn't tell you, hey, I'm going to break in tonight at, you know, three in the morning. No, what happens? It's sudden. It's quick. It's, it's immediate, that thief in the night. And, and he quotes Jesus, who said in Matthew chapter 24, I think, do I have that? Yeah. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and he would not allow his house to be broken into. Jesus is saying, be ready, be alert, because a thief in the night is the, is the way that I'm going to come. So he talked about, he talks about the when. And Peter's going to answer several questions. The first is the when. He's going to come like a thief in the night without warning. So the end times will begin when people least expect it. 
And, you know, isn't it true? Where we live in our everyday lives, we don't think the Lord's going to come back today, but he could. He could. This could be the day. Are you ready? This could be the day that the trumpet blasts and the shout from heaven comes and away we go, flying, right? Harold, the, buck, the truck driver, was correct in the donut shop all those years ago. I'm flying. We don't know. Jesus is warning us. Peter's warning us. Okay, what will happen, Pastor? Let's stay on verse 10. Let's stay on verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. The skies will be gone with a roar. And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be discovered. Two things here. Look at that word roar. The heavens will pass away with a roar. I've talked to firefighters that have run on strike teams to the different forest fires. My son's even one of those that has been in some of the, the strike teams that have gone to the forest fires. There is not only an intense heat that takes place with fires of that nature, but there is a sound. The, the fire, fire um, experts say that, that literally fi forest fires create their own weather systems that it literally sounds like a storm, like a, a wind blowing and fires flaming and trees crackling and popping and collapsing and falling and structures break, falling, that this huge roar can take place in an intense forest fire. Do you know that there's also a 10-mile layer between us and the middle of the earth? And so there's a 10-mile filter or segment of the layers of the earth and then there's some other layers down and then there's the middle of the earth that we live in and that we walk on do you know that in the middle of the earth you know what the temperature is it's 12,500 degrees fahrenheit it would burn anything to an ash immediately right 12,500 degrees and 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 we have a 10 mile layer that god is protecting us with from burning up the earth burning up and melting and all of the elements melting away. And, and so, so it will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be discovered. What, here's what will happen. Verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Stop right there. Since all these things are to be what? Do you know that, that the scripture says this, that the, 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 uh, the, the whole world, everything that we see in the natural, the walls, the chairs you're sitting on, the furniture in your house, all of those things are, are held together atomically. That, that the atom, because they were able to figure out and split the atom, that, that now they were able to make atomic bombs. And so science tells us that when the atomic bombs in World War II hit Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that 200,000 people were killed immediately, and it literally leveled the entire city to ash and dust, including humans. That's how radical the atom is. Do you know what Colossians says about, about Jesus? The Bible says that in him, in Jesus, all things, speaking of the cosmos, the earth, the sky, all things are held together in Christ. That literally Jesus is keeping the atom from blowing up this entire world. That's what that gets to. All these things are to be destroyed in this way. How's it going to happen? The elements will be melted from intense heat. Fires will ensue. The very skies will be lit up. And God will begin to destroy the earth. Why? So that the coming day, you'll read, we'll read about that next verse. The coming day will be the rebuilding of a new heaven and a new earth. Let's get there. All right. All these things will be, keep back up, back up, back up. No, verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and in holy um, and in, in godliness? Let's look at that. What is God? What is holy conduct? Holy conduct is living right with God and separating from the world system. The world system is on its way pathway towards separation from God. 
We can either be a part of the world system or a part of living in God's system of godliness, holy living and godliness. What does holy living mean? Holy living means, uh, holy means separate from the world system, but connected to God's system and walking in the new order that God has for you as a believer. What does he say? Old things shall pass away. All things should become new. Before I was a Christian, I followed the culture's values and ethics. Once I became a Christian, I followed the Bible's values and ethics. And I rearranged my life to follow Christ in that manner. Then he talks about godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is reverence and respect. It's having a reverence for God. It's understanding when God says something to you in your conscience and, and in your spirit. It, it's, it's learning how to walk by the spirit and don't walk by the flesh. It's learning how to recognize the Holy Spirit's voice in your life. And I'm going to teach on the Holy Spirit in the month of July um, as we move forward after Peter. And, and it's learning how to recognize his voice so that when God says, hey, you know what? That's not very godly what you just did. Or that thought wasn't very godly. Or the way you treated that person, that person in your house, or that friend, or that boyfriend, or girlfriend, or husband, or wife, that, that wasn't very godly the way you spoke to them, and the way you treated them, and the way you ignored them, or whatever it might be. From the smallest thing to the biggest thing. We know we shouldn't murder. We know we shouldn't steal. We know we shouldn't uh, uh, have, commit adultery. That we, we get the big stuff, but it's the little things the Holy Spirit begins to shape you and to form you into a man or woman that is godly. That's our goal for you as pastors, that you would be godly, that you would be holy in your conduct, that the influence of the world system would not penetrate the biblical world system that God has placed in your heart and in your life, that you would walk in him in spirit and in truth. And then it goes on in verse 11 to say, Verse 12, looking for and hastening, looking for and hastening the coming day of God. Now, that's different. He said the day of the Lord is about God's intervening judgment in the affairs of mankind and in human history. The day of God refers to the new heavens, because he mentions it, because the heavens will be destroyed by burning and with the elements and will melt with intense heat. Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for what? A new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The day of God refers to that new heaven and that new earth where there's nothing but righteousness dwelling there. There's nothing but God. It's nothing but him. He's on the throne. He's the king. He's the one that we worship. The lamb is there, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is there, Jesus Christ. What am I saying here? Don't get attached to this material world. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in, in all of the things, of, not in all of the things of this world. Put your hope in God's kingdom and what he's doing on earth now and what he's going to be doing in heaven one day when we're with, with him. He says, <coughs> he says hastening. That word hasten, hastening means eagerly desiring the return of Christ. Now, can I be honest with you? There are many, many times I do not eagerly desire for Christ to come today or next week. I mean, I, I've even had these discussions with my kids. They're like, well, wait, Dad, I, I want to raise my kids. I, I want to enjoy, enjoy my life, and I want to do life, and I want to do everything you guys did. And I go, yeah, I get it. You know, I want to see my grandkids grow up and get bigger, and, and, and I want to see my kids grow and, and, and excel in all that God has called them to do. And not today, Lord, you know. You with me? I have to say that there are times that I'm not hastening. I'm not eagerly desiring for the Lord to come. Yet he's calling us to, to, to reminding us that we should. You know, what is he saying? He's saying this world is not all there is. The material things that we see around us are not all there is. The things that are, are, are around us is, is, is a, a glimpse. I think that, that, that we live in a glimpse of what, heaven's going to be like, that this is just a, a type and a shadow and a, 
and an idea of the when we go through the goodness of God while we're here on earth and, and when we enjoy the pleasures and the happy, and the, the happy times and we endure the suffering times and go through the difficult times. You can't enjoy the good times unless you endure the bad times, right? And when we, we live our lives and we say, yeah, it's good. Ultimately, overall, yeah, it's good. But, but, but then that's just a, this is just a glimpse of what's going to take place in heaven. He said, I want you to, to eagerly desire the new heaven and the new earth. And it refers to the final order. The order bef- from the Garden of Eden was different. The order after Noah is different. And there's going to be one more new order of heaven and of earth. It's going to be free from sickness and disease. It's going to be free from the suffering of the human plight. It's going to be free. There will be no tears. It's going to be free of the pain and the struggle of mankind that so many of us feel. It's going to be free in a place where there's no conflict and there's no division. There is only the Lamb of God and the saints of God worshiping the Father together. A place where only righteousness dwells. Only righteousness, not unrighteousness, not evil, not the rule of Satan on this earth. And so 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote it this way. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. This world is not all there is. And I can say this, when I say this to to patients, I get called all the time to go to hospitals, not so much recently because of COVID. But for years, cancer doctors would call me from Stanford and Kaiser and different places, and they would say, hey, I got a patient here, they need to talk to you. And so I would go up and I would sit with them and they were suffering and di- some were dying. And I would sit with them and I'd say, hey, this world's not all there is. And I would begin to talk to them about Christ. And they would say, you know, I, I would have never known that. I would have never thought of that until I went through this death disease that's trying to kill me. This world is not all there is. And so Paul is reminding us of that. And, and I'm glad there's going to be a new heaven. I'm glad there's going to be a new earth. I'm glad that there's the the end times phenomena from the 70s and 80s that totally impacted me. I was thinking about it, and and I think I may have shared this before, but I I have to close with it because part of the, the whole end times teaching stuff was the videos. And the church we went to had a midnight service every New Year's Eve. And on that service, we, they would show the old videos. How many of you remember they were called um, A Thief in the Night was the name of one of them. They were old. They were cheesy. They were like horribly produced. They were like, but they impacted you. They made a point about the end times. And they scared us. They scared you spitless is what they did. And I didn't say the other word, right? And, and so um, one, one was called Vanished. All of a sudden, the rapture occurred, and everybody vanished, and, and Kathy was telling me about it, and she remembered. She goes, yeah, she goes, the women were wearing miniskirts, and they were flying through the air <laughs> because the rapture had taken place. I said, miniskirts? I didn't need that visual. And, and, and I mean, vanished. What was the name of another one? Um, gone. One was called Gone, where the church is just gone, and airplanes are crashing because the pilot was a Christian, and he got raptured. So the airplane was crashing, buses were crashing, cars were getting into wrecks. It was called Gone. And then there was one called the Tribulation, and people were just, you know, being stabbed and martyred and beheaded in it. I mean, it was brutal. It just scared, the, 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 it just scared you. And, and, and here, oh, this one, the image of the beast. Oh, how many of you remember that one? Yeah, scary movies. And these were, these were meant to scare the devil out of you, and they worked. And so I had just, I'd met Kathy two months previously. She had started coming to the church in November, and then on, on, on New Year's Eve, she was there, and, and I, I noticed her in November because I, there was other girls in the church, and I was ready to get married. I was 24 years old thinking, you know, God, any day now, any day, send me, send me help, send me help, please. I just can't do this alone anymore. And, and so sure, Kathy comes in, and I kind of noticed she's by herself in church for a couple of weeks. Going, we went to a small group in a Sunday school class, and, and we, we didn't know each other. It was surface, hello. And, and then, and then uh, she shows up New Year's Eve. And I, I thought she still had a boyfriend, and she was you know, out there doing whatever she was doing. And she shows up New Year's Eve, and guess who's with her? 
her boyfriend. I can't believe I'm talking about this guy after all these years again. <laughs> and so I said, oh, man, she's still with him? Look at that guy. He's ugly. <laughs> Just saying. And she, like, she's defending him. I hear her. She said, no. Poor Sean. And so, and so, so in the, in the intermission from the movies, I decide, you know, this guy really may need the Lord, you know, and she's obviously gotten him here. She's still with him. I'm kind of bummed about that. I thought she broke up with that guy. And, and I, cause I was kind of starting to plan a move, you know? And, and so I was bummed, but you know, I said, I, I love Jesus more. I'm going to go talk to this guy and introduce myself and maybe he needs to know the Lord. I walked up to him. And it was like a fire hose, sweat pouring off his face. I mean, you could have put a bucket under there. It was so coming so quickly. He was scared, spitless at these movies. And he couldn't get out of that church fast enough. And then I found out later they broke up that night. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and I got the girl. Come on. <laughs> All right, what do you need to do? What do you need to do? Poor guy, I feel sorry for him. What do you need to do? You ready? I'm going to give you your marching orders. We've got a soldier in the house. I'm going to give you your marching orders. You ready? Clean up. Clean up. Clean up. Show up. Work hard. Clean up. Get right. Clean up your sin. Clean up your life. Clean up the fleshly things in your life and learn how to walk in the spirit that God has placed in your life. You are full of the Holy Spirit. When you gave your life to Christ, the Spirit indwells in you and empowers you to be the person he wants you to be. Clean up your life and walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. Look up. Remind yourself that this, this world is temporary. Remind yourself that this world is not all there is. Check how you're spending your money. How are you spending your money? How are you spending your time? You can tell what's most valuable in a person's life by the way they spend their time and the way they're spending their money. What am I saying? Invest your time and your money in kingdom things. Not all of it. Obviously, we got to live. But God's given you a, a, a portion so that you can invest. You can return it to him, the Bible says. Return a portion to the Lord because I've, as Brad was saying, I've gifted you to be able to work, to be able to produce income. Return a portion. Invest in the kingdom of God, in your time and in your money. And then lastly, speak up. Clean up, look up, speak up. Who do you need to share Christ with before he comes? Like I said earlier, I'm glad he didn't come two weeks before I gave my life to Christ. I'm glad I still have time. I had time to give my life to him, to walk with him and to influence others for the message of Jesus. Who are you going to miss in heaven? Speak up. Who, who's going to be left behind? And you know it. Pray for them. Pray 2 Peter 3, 9 prayers over them pray for their com communicate your heart to them pray for them to know the Lord stay busy stay alert stay ready to meet the Lord every single day of your lives clean up your life look up expect his return there's more to this world than we see and lastly speak up to share the love of Christ with others that you love and there's a new world coming church He's done it in the past. He'll do it again. His promises are true. I want to read you about the new world. Here's what it's going to look like. You ready? Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, for the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. Next verse. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Next verse. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. That's us. And he will dwell with them. God will dwell with us. They will be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. Next verse. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order of things is passed away. Next verse. 
I did not see a temple in that city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Next verse. Next verse. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God will be the light and the Lamb will be its lamp. Next verse. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Next verse. And no day, and on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Next verse. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Next verse. Nothing impure ever will enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be there. Amen. Let's all stand. Stand. We're done. We're done. Stand. Lord, I want to be in the Lamb's book of life. I want everybody in the sound of my voice to be in the Lamb's book of life. I want them to be there where there's no more sin. There's no more cancer. There's no more sickness. There's no more debilitating disease in the lives of mankind. There's no more poverty. There's no more taking place of of deceitful, sinful things on this earth. There's no more enemy that will tempt us. There's none of those things, God. You, you have written our name in the Lamb's book of life. And we thank you for it, God. And we, we eagerly look for your return, knowing you're taking us to a a place that's new. And so just while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, what do you need to clean up today? Maybe some of you said, Pastor, I got to clean up some stuff in my life. I know I'm doing wrong. I know I'm, I'm sinning. I know I'm messing up. I need to clean that area up in my life. Just lift your hand up. I want to pray for you. Yep, thank you. You can put it down. How many of you are not sure that you're written in the Lamb's book of life? Let's, let's, I want you to be sure. Don't leave this place. Thank you. Thank you. Don't leave this place without being sure. That's the greatest thing we have, is we have the assurance that Jesus Christ has saved us when we invite him into our hearts and when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord of our lives. And so, Lord, we want to do that now. Just pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I confess you as my Lord, and I believe in my heart that you have risen from the dead. And I give my life to you right now. For those that need to be cleaned up, Lord, and cleanse me and wash me. Pray that prayer. Lord, wash me and cleanse me. I repent, God. I want to change. I want to do your will. I want to walk in your truth. I want to be a part of, of, of being on the wide, the, the narrow road that leads to heaven, not the wide road of the culture that leads to hell. God, I want to be a part of your new order and what you're going to do in the coming years. And so I submit myself to you. Lord, I pray for those that are believing you for miracles and things to take place in their lives. Until you come, God, we want to be faithful. We want to be obedient. We want to walk with you in spirit and in truth. And we're going to trust you all the days of our life. And we're going to fight the good fight of faith that you've called us to. Amen and amen and amen. All right. I'm going to invite some of my prayer teams, if you would join us at the altar and help me out with prayer. You need to come and pray and get right with God. You want to kneel at the altar. You want to pray with somebody here this morning. Some of my deacons or elders that are here would come and help out with prayer. I would appreciate that. All right. And let's go out. Let's be thankful for the coming of the Lord. Amen. Let's eagerly desire it. Let's hasten it. Let's hasten the coming of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Worship with me for a moment.
God bless you as you leave this place. Uh, the altars will stay open with our prayer team this morning. If you still need prayer, we're going to keep uh, playing a little bit for you. Have a great day, New Hope. God bless you.